May 6, 1864, the second day of the Battle of the Wilderness. Major Henry Livermore Abbott was fighting his last battle in the tangled woods with his regiment, the 20th Massachusetts. Just three years earlier, he had contemplated war and wondered if he had the spirit to be a warrior, writing to his father. I don't pretend to have the enthusiasm of Ned and Fletch. Indeed, I confess that I know myself to be constitutionally timid. But history shows a great many men who have conquered that kind of thing. And when I look back, I don't see any instance where I've displayed a want of physical courage where it was absolutely necessary. My tastes are not warlike. I can think of nothing more odious than the thought of leaving home and profession for the camp. But now that I have once begun, the prospect of backing out without doing anything is still more odious. I should be ashamed of myself forever if I didn't do something now. His first battle experience had been at Ball's Bluff in October 1861, a battle that had cost the 20th Massachusetts many casualties. Dear Papa, we miraculously escaped without a wound, all the officers of our company, that is, half the men of the regiment killed and wounded. It also started forming Abbott's military leadership, beginning the 19-year-old's journey as one of the most respected regimental officers in the Union's Army of the Potomac. You know I told you that I didn't believe I was physically brave. In fact, I was pretty sure I should be frightened on the field of battle, though I hoped my feelings of duty, pride, and honor would keep me up. The fact is, however, that on the battlefield, I was very much surprised to find that I wasn't frightened at all. Promotion came early for Abbott, and he recounted the moment in a letter to his father in December 1861. Dear Papa, I am happy. I am first lieutenant, detailed as acting captain of Company I, and I really believe that they are glad as I am, for tonight, after dress parade, there was the uncommon sound of loud cheering. By February 1862, Abbott worried that he would not experience a grand battle with the 20th Massachusetts, the Harvard Regiment. He explained his feelings in a letter home. I am horribly afraid we shan't see any more service and that the fighting will all be done in the rear of the Southern Potomac Army. I don't mean, of course, that I love fighting for itself, but I do earnestly long to be in a grand battle. If a fellow should go through this war and never be in anything but that murderous little skirmish where we got licked, it would be outrageous. I think we should have a good right to complain. But such seems to be the prospect now. A little while ago, I thought from what Colonel Palfrey gleaned at headquarters that there was a strong prospect of an advance, but I am afraid it is hopeless. He shouldn't have been worried. He would see plenty of combat action in 1862. The regiment marched and fought up the Virginia Peninsula in General McClellan's grand scheme to take Richmond the capital of the Confederacy. Then they engaged in the Seven Days Battles during the hot summer. Abbott was wounded in the right arm and returned to his home and parents in Massachusetts for a few weeks of recuperation. He returned to the regiment by August 1862, shortly before receiving the tragic news of his brother's death in combat at the Battle of Cedar Mountain. Until I got the newspapers and Mama's letter day before yesterday, I thought Ned only wounded. I got your letter yesterday. It came upon me with terrible force. I could hardly believe it. I thought Ned would surely come through all right. It is very hard to think that we will never see him again. Abbott fought at the Second Battle of Bull Run in August 1862 
then was forced to seek leave and treatment in a hospital for much of the autumn. He rejoined the 20th Massachusetts in time for the Battle of Fredericksburg at the end of the year, leading in the street fighting and later describing his experience in the attacks on December 13th toward Murray's Heights. Then came our turn. We had about 200 men. We advanced two or three rods over the brow of the hill under a murderous fire without the slightest notion of what was intended to be accomplished. Our men, however, though they could not be got to advance in double quick against the rifle pits, which we soon perceived, they held their position firmly until Colonel Hall, seeing that the pits could only be carried at the run, and that if carried, they were completely enfiladed by a rebel battery on the hill, ordered us to retire, which we did in good order. By 1863, there were periods of time when Abbott commanded the 20th Massachusetts in the absence of higher ranking officers. He frequently wrote about his commitment to his men and to the unit's battlefield victories. I am in command of the regiment, Macy having started for home on leave of 15 days. Oh, by Jove, you don't know how much I would give to be permanent commander of this regiment and I can hardly imagine greater bliss than to be commander of a regiment in which all the companies were as good as my own. I feel that I belong to the regiment, and as God has spared my life so long through great dangers, I trust he will if I remain with the regiment, as I am the only officer here that came out with it. Though he had successfully led during the Chancellorsville Campaign, Battle of Gettysburg, and Battle at Bristow Station in 1863, Abbott predicted that the coming battles in the spring of 1864 would be unlike anything he had ever experienced. I suspect myself we shall have the biggest fight the world ever saw. This regiment, I expect will take the field with 400 muskets and 15 company officers, the largest number since the days of the Peninsula, with Webb for brigade commander, Gibbon for division, and Hancock for corps. We have got a team that can't be beat. He may not have known it, but General George Meade, commander of the Army of the Potomac, was prepared to offer him a position on staff at Army headquarters. Still, when the 20th Massachusetts moved into Central Virginia at the beginning of the Overland Campaign, Abbott marched at the head of his original regiment. He wrote one last letter to his sister, days before the campaign started. My dear Carrie, the newspapers say that the males have been stopped from the army. And so, before I revel in the luxury of receiving hosts of letters without answering, I have seized the opportunity offered by Captain Walker's kindness, who is going home, discharged for disability by reason of wounds. How soon do you go to Grantville? I hope I shall be home to your marriage next autumn. We have got a large number of German recruits, I suppose you know, enough to muster all our officers, and we shall take the field. They took the field of battle on May 5th, charging into an attack and halting a Confederate advance on the Union position at Brock Road in the wilderness. On the following day, May 6th, 1864, the Union line was in danger of collapse again. The 20th Massachusetts was ordered into a desperate head-on attack along the Orange Plank Road. Their colonel was shot leaving Major Henry Abbott to command the regiment. They had already lost about one-third of their men in the charge, and Abbott ordered the rest of the unit to lie down in their forward position. It was about 12.30 in the afternoon. Confederates crept closer, but the 20th Massachusetts held the road, giving other Union regiments time to reform and organize a new defensive line. Abbott walked behind his prone soldiers, encouraging them. Three years of battle and leadership had prepared him for this moment when his regiment would make a significant difference for the Union lines in the wilderness. 
another officer would remember. I was proud of him, as back and forth he slowly walked. Then a bullet ripped through Major Abbott's abdomen. He collapsed to the ground, and moments later his regiment was forced to retire. Soldiers carried their wounded officer to a field hospital behind the battle lines. There, Abbott calmly made his last requests. Other wounded officers from the 20th Massachusetts were at his side in the field hospital when the 22-year-old breathed his last. General Alexander Webb wrote in his official report, No truer soldier was in my command. His reputation as an officer stood far beyond the usual eulogies pronounced on our dead officers. I feel that his merit was so peculiar and his worth so well known to all the officers of the Corps and to the general commanding that it is not necessary for me to attempt to do him justice. My brigade lost in him its best officer.